Hi everyone, I'm Chloe and welcome back to the Mentors Connect podcast. Today, super duper excited to be talking to Steve Vallis. He is one of the most influential people in Australia when it comes to blockchain. He is the CEO of Blockchain Australia and has some super cool and amazing insights to share with us. So super excited today to be talking to him and hopefully he can show us, you know, a few secrets that he's got maybe that we all don't know yet. But thank you, Steve, so much for meeting me today. I'm very happy to play a part in the podcast and the video. So I wanted to get us started. So tell us a bit about how you got into this exciting space, because I'm assuming that you didn't just get into it a year ago when most people have gotten into this space. No, I think I, w- I wasn't t- too early. I can't really be classified as an OG, but I was early enough to know that most people didn't think this was going to be a, an area of much interest. So I was living another life, basically. I was working as a digital strategist. I was doing a lot of management consulting, but I found myself in lots of rooms where people were talking about things that made them all sound the same. You know, the the advice they were given sounded the same. The tools they were using sounded the same. And then blockchain conversations sort of edged their way into those rooms. And I recognized it for what it was. It's really hard to get a sense of this. You've got to commit the time to understanding it. And there are very few people that have done that. So I looked at it just from an opportunity perspective and said, it's rare to find yourself in a space where you can win because you commit more effort starting today. Mm. You know, traditionally you have people who are in very familiar roles, lawyers, accountants, doctors, they'll say I've been doing this for 20 years and that's the, the that's the passport of success. In this space, I love the fact that you could be 18 years of age or 16 years of age in your case. You could be 66 years of age. And if you're willing to do the work, you can really move through a lot of the space really quickly. So that's what enticed me into it. It was fun, hard, and not too many people recognized the opportunity. And that's so cool. Now look at you, you know, leading the way here in Australia. So that's awesome. So now I wanted to get on to a few questions I've prepared. And firstly, sure. to get some of our listeners up to speed who maybe perhaps don't really understand blockchain or its use case, I wanted you to tell us a bit, what is blockchain and why is it the future? Sure. Uh, the thing for most people that works in the rooms, I mean, is framing the conversation. And I often frame it one one end of the spectrum to the other end of the spectrum. A lot of the time when people think about blockchain, they think about something like Bitcoin. They think about a cryptocurrency. They think about the properties of that cryptocurrency. That is for many people what blockchain is. And it might be the maxis in the space that say there is only one chain. It is Bitcoin. Anything else is rubbish. But those properties are pretty obvious. They're cryptocurrency. um, They have a degree of privacy. They're immutable. That's the language you often hear. At the other end of the spectrum, you have what I characterize as business as usual. You talk about a lot of things that help make processes better. You can make businesses more efficient, much more vanilla, much more boring. uh, But that's where a lot of the conversation happens in Australia. It's how do you make existing businesses better? And you take some of the same qualities. You take things like the ability to move data packets. You take things like privacy or permission networks. And you say, how does it improve a process? So depending on where you are, one is the future, a libertarian paradise. And the other one is, how do we make our mousetrap a little bit better? Uh, They're they're the framings for me of the conversation. No, I think that's a good way to do it, definitely. So now, continuing on, I want to get a bit of your opinion. So you kind of framed it there for us. There's a lot of use cases of blockchain technologies. What perhaps aspect or use case of blockchain do you think is the most exciting or going to be the most important in the future? I think the reality of what gets attention is financial services, Chloe. The the truth is money makes money, moving money makes money, process improvement when it comes to money makes money. So I think it is a very obvious use case that people are seeing opportunities then to invest in in the infrastructure and in some cases what people believe the future of money to be. So that's where the wave is. That's where the momentum is. It's why governments around the world are particularly interested in this subject matter because you're creating potentially new assets, digital assets, variations of existing assets. Um, So that's that's where the the most obvious use case is. Within Australia, we've started in a different spot. If you go back a couple of years, we looked at things more obviously at the time, supply chain, we looked in the education sector, we looked at at the reg tech sector. Those areas are not less interesting, but they're actually less risky in most people's minds. So it was a very good place to start the conversation. But now from a global perspective, You see that the conversations have shifted into things like central bank digital currencies and digital wallets and how do we store value. So the reality is the money has arrived. So because the money has arrived, uh, the interest has arrived as well. No, cool. And I wanted to use your conversation a bit there, talking about, you know, financial services, central bank um, coins and everything. 
to talk about, you know, how do you see regulators approaching, you know, the Web 3.0 blockchain, Web 3.0, as I said before, as, as the space evolves, like, do you think innovation will be limited? Regulators are struggling, Chloe, fair to say, around the world. And part of it was to do with the fact that this sort of crept up on people, you know, notwithstanding the fact that there was a lot of chatter about it. A lot of people who formed a view about this space formed the view three or four years ago and kind of parked it and decided it wasn't worth looking at again. The world has changed from 2017 and 18 and 19 and 20. So what's ended up happening is the technology has built out an extraordinary really fast pace. Investment is coming as extraordinarily fast pace. And what's happened with regulators is they've realised that the great challenge for them is this is borderless in its nature. You know, normally it's much easier in a country like Australia to say the squiggly line that distinguishes state to state or Australia from the rest of the world is a natural barrier to things. We have this physical divide that isn't the case with this technology. So the question then becomes, what do you do if that physical divide is not the thing that distinguishes Australia from the rest of the world? And what's the implication for regulators? And regulators generally like to control their own jurisdiction and some like to have influence outside of it. So it's it's a very different way for regulators to look at things because the way the technology, as you know, is rolled out, I don't need the permission of anyone to send something to the other side of the world. If you're talking about data packets across the internet, it can be done. There are all sorts of challenges for regulators that they didn't anticipate happening. And now there is a rearguard action. A lot of resourcing is now going into it. A lot of education is going into it. Um, and they're going to catch up at some point in time. It's just a question of which jurisdiction, Australia hopefully be one of them, that is forward thinking enough to establish itself as a leader in this space around the world. I kind of want to build off that, a bit off topic, but I remember reading about there's like this island this like companies planning on making, you know, they're going to have like all the crypto and it's not going to be like a jurisdiction. Do you think that's going to actually possibly hurt the blockchain industry in countries like Australia where it's harder to do regulation and these new islands and areas allowing innovators to roam freely and, you know, go about the technology they want to? I think it, it's so early that the truth is it's a little bit like going to a buffet and saying, what, what food is the food that's most interesting to you? People look for characteristics that suit the business model or the opportunity that they're trying to create. Australia has particular characteristics, like we have a very uh, familiar, very secure regulatory framework. We're a safe place to build things out. There's not a lot of surprises in the way you do things here. That suits some businesses. Some other businesses might say, you know what, we need a full thinking jurisdiction we need a jurisdiction that provides greater tax concessions for example and it might be the case that someone says what jurisdiction is willing to offer that so you are tending to look for something which suits your business profile and business case the the asterisk here and the thing that's been lost on a lot of people is there's been uh, a narrative and ultimately a, an untruth of sorts that is people are moving towards places that have less uh, regulation or potentially have less desire to be involved in this space from a very strict regulatory perspective. It's just not the case. You know, people are looking for roots. They're looking, they're looking to set up businesses, to hire people, to invest money, and that has to come with certainty. So I think we're seeing a bit of a flipping now around that conversation. And again, hopefully Australia is well placed to take advantage of the fact that we can move fast enough to change things, but not so fast that we break everything at the same mm. time. No, I reckon that's wise words, definitely. So now I want to just continue on. The metaverse has been something that's blown up in the past year. And I wanted to hear from you. Do you envision in 10 years, you know, all of us living and working in the metaverse? Again, a little bit uh, the same as the smorgasbord example. The reality of the metaverse at the moment and conversations around NFTs, I was putting slides of cats on the blockchain uh, in presentations five years ago and people thought I was crazy when I said this is the future of the internet. I should, have, uh, I should have bought a few of those JPEGs and uh, I think I'd be much better off now. But Whoa. the idea to me made sense five years ago. When we talked about what is that representation of digital value? And in that case, it seemed like a joke. It was a cat on the blockchain. Crypto kitties were the slides that I had mm. on there. You flash forward and a lot of the, the, the uh, space has matured, but for some reason it captured the imagination of people. And now that we do see it as JPEGs and bored apes, and, and, and punks and anything and everything under the sun, people can digest that, Chloe. So once you can digest it, then you are onboarded into broader conversation. So you say, I like the image. How do I get the image? Well, I need to download this thing. I need to put this, this app on my phone. I need to understand what it is to use Ethereum and I need to know what it is to buy ApeCoin to, to allow me to get to, uh, this product minted. So it just sets you on a path. And the first step that you need is the most important step. NFTs in this conversation around the metaverse is something that feels... It doesn't feel so far from where people are. Do I think 10 years from now um, we'll be living in that space? I think, I think the reality is some of these worlds will be extraordinary. They'll create enormous value. 
some people would probably prefer to live in the metaverse, but the reality is I think we're stuck here in the in the real world uh, for the foreseeable future. <laughs> Good one. So now um, I want to talk about because the Mental Clinic podcast, most of our listener base is people from you know younger geographics. So I wanted to hear from you. What role do you think young people will play like in the future implementation of blockchain? Uh, Chloe, I've, I've done a lot of mentoring through universities and a bunch of uh, startups over a long period of time. I, I love the fact that you can win at this at any age. That I said to you at the, at the beginning of this conversation, there is no one that can, you shouldn't be looking at middle-aged men like me that sit around going, you can't do this or you shouldn't do this. Who cares what people who look like me say? The important part here is just going ahead and, and, and doing it. And I think the reality of this technology, a lot of the opportunities here uh, very much give you an opportunity to participate one way or another. You don't have to be a dev. You know, you can you can invest your time in some other element of the community or you can work in marketing in relation to it. There's lots of opportunities that are that are developing across spaces. It's just do you feel connected to the project? Because the reality of most people who are 16 and above now, not the case when I was 16, people are looking for purposeful uses of their time. They want to know they can make a difference. They want to know they can build things and they want to know they're going to be incentivized and rewarded for doing it. And there's no requirement now that someone can say to you, wait for 10 years or 20 years before you get that opportunity. That opportunity can be taken by people at any age at the moment, which is which is what makes it super exciting for me. I like people walking into the room and knowing more than the person that says, I've been doing this for 20 years. I like people to be told, sit down champ. I don't <laughs> think you know more than me. I've worked harder in a short period of time and I've managed to catch you up. So that, that's what I think. I think the opportunity is there to be grabbed much uh, and that's one of the challenges of the space as well and, and sort of tech as far as I'm concerned if you don't take the opportunity it will pass you by but at least you have an opportunity to sort of uh, take it uh, take it as it comes you listeners listen to what just Steve just said so I encourage you all to go research about it. it's a lot of fun I can speak from experience but now before we finish up the podcast I was hoping Steve if you could give a piece of advice to perhaps someone who is aspiring to become a blockchain leader at 20 or 40 or whatever age? Uh, consumption of uh, the material around, the resources, you, you have to do it at an accelerated pace. You know, you, it doesn't matter what the mechanism is for doing it. Um, there's no better uh, $10 a month than buying a, a YouTube premium account. Press, uh, press 1.8 times speed or two times speed. Just consume as quickly as you possibly can. You know, download podcasts, play them at speed, consume it as you, as you possibly can. This is the thing that sets you apart at the moment. The one bit of advice is just run faster than others. The, the, the way to get ahead of people, the way to, to move forward is you just have to consume at a faster rate. Once you get to a certain point, Chloe, you'll start realising what's worth listening to and not. So at first, before people choose the space, it's important to go really wide, get a real sense of what this ecosystem is, and then you start developing expertise. Too many people now, given, of course, you, you hear stories of people uh, making fortunes overnight, they tend to jump straight in. It's like running a marathon before you've done any preparation. So the first thing is consume as widely as you possibly can and then have a sense of what space you'd like to spend more of your time in and then dive in and develop experience. Once you have that domain experience, it's yours to lose. Well, thank you so much. That was a really great piece of advice. And thank you again, Steve, for coming onto the podcast and sharing with us all your amazing insights and just talking to us today. It was really fun. Pleasure, Chloe. Thanks for having me.